and uh, and I fell completely in love with the country because I always thought I was born too late to see pristine, wide open spaces and wildlife and lion and I thought it was something of the past. And when I got into Namibia and I traveled a bit around, I saw that there was still this uh, this pristine, uh, untouched uh, landscape and uh, and wild areas. So it made me completely dependent of it. It, it provided me a happiness I never found before in, in any other country. Uh, it calmed me down, it stabilized me. Uh, it really brought me happiness. And since then, I have the feeling that I owe Namibia something. Because Namibia made me happy, so I want to also to make in my small way uh, Namibia also happy to contribute towards the, towards the well-being of Namibia. First of all, I would like to thank you to uh, take the opportunity to have a chat with me on uh, the podcast. And today we would like to talk a bit about you, about Tosco Eco Safari conservation in, uh, in Namibia. Um, the point of the podcast is basically to interview different people from different walks of life to learn a bit what they think, how they see the world and uh, what they're occupied with in their daily life. So, um, if it's good with you, I'd like to ask you a bit, who is Felix, um, and how did you get here into Namibia, have you traveled in Africa, this kind of thing. Okay, thank you for your time, thank you for your interest. You're welcome. Um, it's good that we use uh, this break of the, of the, of the COVID uh, to do some uh, interesting and positive things, so I appreciate also that, uh, that, you, want take, that you want to take some time to... Uh, to find out some uh, some stories and some positive stories. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Felix. I've been in Namibia now for the last uh, 16 years. Okay. Uh, I arrived here when I was 24 years old. Uh, I used to travel in other parts of Africa before. I cycled from Paris in France to Senegal to uh, to Dakar. I traveled a bit in uh, in Western Africa. Okay. It was uh, it was for me a kind of a revelation. It was it was extraordinary. But I missed a little bit of the wide open spaces that I used to read in some books when I was a teenager. The wildlife, the the landscape. Western Africa was uh, on the on a cultural point of view extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. But I didn't feel the um, the nature in Africa I grew up with when I was reading books when I was uh, when I was a teenager. Uh, books of, of people who are discovering uh, uh, the Cape province in South Africa, the, the navigators. So I was always missing something. So that's why when I finished my studies uh, in Lyon, in France, I found I was looking for a way to find a job first and to settle and to know the basic and, uh, and the reality of life. I didn't want to travel with my backpack anymore because I was, I was lucky enough to travel uh, in the five different continents before I was uh, 24 years old. And, um, and I saw the limit of traveling with a backpack. Actually, you meet other people, but also from, um, not really from the, from the country, but uh, other backpackers. You sleep in, in backpackers' house, you go to the cyber cafe. And, uh, and for me, it was not the real way of traveling. So I, was, so I took a one-way uh, ticket. I didn't want any return. And I wanted to find a job and not just to travel around. So I found a job to do a, a French-speaking uh, airport shuttle in 2004 uh, in Windhoek, Namibia. I didn't know anything about Namibia. I was happy uh, to pick to have some, to find something in Namibia because I knew no one who was living there. Nobody told me anything about the country. So it was like a whole blank page to open. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it was, it was a good start. And, uh, and I fell completely in love with the country because I always thought I was born too late to see pristine, wide open spaces and wildlife and lion. And I thought it was something of the past. And when I got into Namibia and I traveled a bit around, I saw that there was still this, uh, this pristine, uh, untouched uh, landscape and, uh, and wild areas. So it made me completely dependent of it. It, it provided me a happiness I never found before in, in any other country. Uh, it calmed me down, it stabilized me. Uh, it really brought me happiness and since then I have the feeling that I owe Namibia something because Namibia made me happy so I want to also to make in my small way uh, Namibia also happy to contribute towards, uh, towards the well-being of Namibia and uh, I did my experience in, in uh, different companies in tourism 
Uh, I did a, uh, I did a uh, training to be to be a tour guide. I did tours for for some years, and uh, I get to a point where I was not really anymore in um, in agreement with the tours I was doing. I didn't like the tours I was doing too too much. I thought there would be a better way to uh, to do it, but I didn't find that way. Mm. So I preferred uh, to quit. So I've, uh, I came back to France after six years in Namibia because I was not, uh, I was not happy uh, anyway with the tourism I was doing. Uh, I felt like tourism was using and taking much more than it was giving back. But because I had no solution, I preferred to, um, to stop what I was doing and to try to do something else. So I went back to France, uh, got depressed <laughs> <laughs> after six or eight months. Mm. Uh, so I came back to Namibia with the will to do something different. And uh, then I met some people. And I met some people who really had a huge influence on my, on my life and on, on my professional career. Uh, I met um, Philip Stander. He's a, he's a researcher studying at Desert Alliance in Namibia. Mm -hmm. And I met Garth Owen Smith, who is the father of uh, community conservation in Namibia. And uh, I had a couple of, of campfire discussion with them. And both were, were a bit not complaining, but wondering why tourism is not doing more for conservation. Mm. When you talk about conservation, you find uh, the government, of course, in Namibia, the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, MET. You find the local communities, the people uh, living in uh, conservation areas, and you find in NGOs, local NGOs, like mm. IRDNC, but also international NGOs like WWF. And tourism, who is one of the biggest users of nature, mm. is not really at the table. So I felt like they were, I don't know if they were asking me something or telling me something, but me, I was coming from tourism. So for me, um, it was a little hint that I should actually uh, start something, an organization that will represent tourism, uh, who contributes and uh, support conservation in Namibia. And this was the start of Tosco? This was the start of Tosco. So Tosco means tourism supporting conservation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started it as a trust in, uh, in 2012, uh, in a very small and humble way at the beginning. I was just looking for some members to fundraise money for the Desert Lion Conservation, because uh, when you come from tourism, it's, everything is about lion almost, or at least big cats. And uh, so it's the most appealing cause. And, uh, and for me, it was the most uh, sexiest and, uh, and at attracting cause. So I started to fundraise for Desert Lion Conservation, trying to involve tourism and trying to make tourism understand the needs and the reality of conservation. I've always been amazed on how little tourism understands the challenge of conservation and how little conservation understands the, the challenge of tourism. It's mm -hmm. two different worlds that don't speak to each other, even though they look at the same thing. They look at the same animal, they look at the lion. You have, you have tourists looking at the lion, you have NGOs looking at the lion, and you have local communities looking at the lion. But these three people don't talk to each other. Mm. And they don't know the issues and, um, and the advantages everyone has from their own point of view around the same lion. Mm. Uh, tourists have money and they want to see the lion. Uh, local communities are afraid uh, of the lions and they want to kill it but they don't have much knowledge about the lion. Mm. The NGOs and the researchers have a lot of knowledge about the lion. They know how to find them, but they also lack, of, lack uh, for some funding. So if you build a bit of, uh, of bridges between these three, actually everyone can answer the other's difficulties and challenges and help each other. So Tosco was made also to establish this communication and mm. to have a better understanding of each other. Um, so yeah, that's how it started. I was alone for the first uh, several years. Uh, which was a bit challenging because I was also starting a family. Uh, I have two kids and uh, I've started my own tourism company, Eco Safaris, mm. to do tours more in adequation with what I wanted to do. And I, uh, since then, I think that tourism should be a tool for conservation and not the other way around. And conservation should not only serve uh, tourism, mm. but to have a bigger picture and to see that uh, in the end, what matters is conservation and that we can use different tools for that. So I also started my own safari company. Eco so Safaris. Eco Safari, Eco yes. Safari. And both of them were a bit feeding on each other. It's mm -hmm. like a symbiosis. I was using Eco Safaris to support Tosco, mm -hmm. and I was also using Tosco to open up my mind and to open up new ways of doing tourism, closer to the local people, supporting more conservation of the beaten track. Um, and, I will, and, 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 and a bit later, I will, I will come back to this, uh, offsetting all the carbon emissions 
of my tools. Okay. Would it be fair to say that even though your heart is with tourism, your main interest at the moment would be conservation? And if this is so, um, could you maybe give a brief overview of conservation in Namibia? I know it's a wide topic, but maybe some project which you are working on uh, very closely. And then also in Namibia, we have something which is called uh, conservancies. And maybe it would be nice um, for the listeners or watchers to know what the conservancy actually, actually is. Yes, yes. I was extremely lucky to, um, to put a fit in Namibia because, uh, because um, conservation here, we, we work with prime material, mm. was never, who has not been much changed by the human footprint. Mm. Uh, it's a country where we can find outside of national parks a big number of animals, even in desert area. It's like, a, it's like two miracles. We find big game, elephant, rhino, dan dangerous game like lion, outside of national park, which is extremely rare in Africa, and uh, in a desert. So they are desert adapted and they are outside of national park. So it's like two miracles that, that, is, that are happening in Namibia. Because there is a very low density in the country, uh, and it's very dry, there is no uh, big cultures, so the landscape has not been modified much. Mm. Um, in France, I think only 5% of the territory has not been touched by men, which is the summit of the different mountains in the Alps and in the Pyrenees. Mm. In Nigeria, it's the opposite, it's 95% that has not been really uh, touched uh, by men, especially in some areas. Mm. Um, in Naibia, 24% of the territory is our national parks that, that belong to the government. Uh, another 30-40% are private land, and the rest are communal lands, which means there is no private property, there is no fences. The lands belong to the government, and the government lets the local people and the local community use this land. Mm. But nobody says, this land is mine, and I put a fence around it. So for the animals, especially in a dry area, it's very important that they can move freely around. Mm. So we have wild animals outside of the national park with no fences adapted to the desert. Um, in the 80s, there was four years without any rain. And uh, the people were using, uh, were using the wildlife for their own benefit without the authorization from the government. So it was called poaching. But actually poaching is a bit like, um, like Robin Hood. You just steal something from the rich, which was the government at the stage, to use for, for yourself and for the people who don't have much, uh, much benefit from the wildlife, even though they live with it, so they pay the cost of living with wildlife, but they don't benefit from it. So there is no incentive for them to, mm. uh, to protect it. And there was a man called Garth Owen Smith, who unfortunately uh, passed away two days ago. This gentleman have a big influence on, on your life, yes. on the way of seeing things? Yes, 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 mm. a lot. A lot. And uh, he's the one, uh, I, called him, uh, I, I called him my spiritual uh, grandfather. He's extremely humble, he always showed me, uh, he always listened. He's a man with a great experience and he was listening everyone like he was the most important uh, p uh, person in the, on the earth. He was giving advice but never listens. Mm. And, um, and he was the one who had a, v a vision, even though in a time of apartheid, where it was very difficult to give responsibilities and to trust local communities, to say that to arrest a poacher does not end poaching. Uh, in the 80s, during these four years, there was a lot of poaching of rhinos and big game and elephant for the ivory, it was even commercial. Mm -hmm. um, and he says that rather than, uh, than hammering on the people who poach, we should rather give them an uniform, give them a salary, they are the one who knows the bush the, the best. Uh, if you arrest a poacher, he will be replaced by someone else. If you arrest a poacher, you will take away from a family somebody who is feeding the family, so you make the, the, the condition poorer mm -hmm. and it will not make them support conservation. It's not when you hit someone that you make him agree with you. Mm. So, uh, so he convinced the government to give responsibility towards the wildlife for the local community and it was the beginning of the conservancies. So the conservancies are local communities who deal directly with their wildlife in a consumptive, like hunting, and non-consumptive way, mm. like tourism. Um, and the government let them do it as long as they do it in a sustainable way. So every year, uh, they do a game count, like you have done a ribbon already, mm -hmm. uh, to see if the population are managed in a sustainable way. And depending on the result, they give some quotas and they give the right for the people to uh, directly benefit from their wildlife without, without using the government. And it was a huge success. And uh, that's why uh, today uh, 
30 years later, we have, uh, we have uh, all this wildlife at an National Park and the mentality to protect it. Of course, it's not always 100%. Uh, we talked about 95% of the population who are, who, who are supportive of this, of this effort, but there is always a, a smaller percentage of people who are still poaching, who are not uh, making much efforts to live with, uh, with wildlife, of course. But we rather focus on the solution than on the problem, we rather focus on the light than on the darkness. Mm. And then basically there's uh, it's a quote from uh, Gzimek, it's better to light a cancel candle than to curse the darkness. Exactly. Um, exactly. Korongoro. Um, basically, um, what I would like to ask, of course, there's many projects, but I know you are yeah. deeply involved with uh, the Desert Lion pro project. You have good um, relations with Flip Standard. You also do a lot for, for the lions. You sponsor with Tosco a lot of these uh, GPS uh, collars in order to track them. Yeah. Um, where are we today? Um, is the population stable? How are the communities reacting to it? Is it possible for the communities to, to live together? Uh, with these predators and uh, what are we doing in order to facilitate both sides? Yes, yes, this is a bit of a hot topic because mm. when, when we talk about human uh, wildlife conflict, mm. it's always very emotional. It's like a bit like, uh, like hunting. It's hard to, um, to have a very neutral and objective uh, uh, way of thinking, a uh, mindset about it. Uh, so yes, Tosco still does desert lion conservation support, not only, huh? maybe I will come back on the other programs because oh. it's not only about lion. Uh, we find out that under lion, many other species fall and there is other important things. Actually, the most important thing for conservation is the grass. Mm. This is the, the biotope that supports all of the species. Okay. Uh, but it's not to talk about grass is not as sexy as talking about lion. But that's why I asked but, you about the lion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's the root of uh, that, yeah. that. That should be the main subject. Yes. Um, so 20 years ago, there was uh, only maybe 20 lions mm. in the Kunene. It's an area, again, outside of natural parks. It's an area, it's, uh, an area that is as big as 50,000 square, square kilometers. Only 20 lions escaped from Etosha. Etosha is fenced, especially on the western side, it's even electrified fence. Escaped from Etosha, survived uh, in the farms and did not get killed in the farm and, yet, and then arrived into the desert and tried to make a life in the desert. Uh, there was not much tolerance towards uh, lion and big predators in that time. We talk uh, again about farmers who have to share their, um, their land with, uh, with, with dangerous game. Mm. Uh, and Philip Stander was, was working in Etosha. He heard about lion on the sea. There was a photograph of a lion in 84 uh, on the beach scavenging on a whale. Mm. And then it really, uh, it really turned his mindset of finding this lion and studying this lion because he must have a behavior quite uh, specific. So during 20 years, uh, it took him, I think, three or four years to find his first lion. He was using an airplane to track the lion to see, uh, to see them. It took him years to find his first lion. Mm. And uh, since then, uh, he studied them to see how they adapted to the, to the desert. And he made a lot of efforts for, uh, for, um, for trying to, for the local people to tolerate lion, to give them information, to bring lions to them when they were putting a, put a slip to mm. say if you want to kill it, it's your lion, you can kill it. So also to give responsibility to the people about the lion mm. and try to develop lion tourism. Mm.